Today's story is centered around the death of Joel Silva, a member of the Hells Angels. In May of 2023, a federal jury found Raymond Folks, also known as Ray Ray, and Christopher Ranieri, who was known as Rain Man, guilty of racketeering conspiracy, murder conspiracy and related crimes. Prior to this, Jonathan Nelson, or John John, along with Brian Went and Russell Ott, aka Rusty, was found guilty of similar crimes. We will be jumping around a little bit while detailing this story, but try to stick with us. Let's get into it. The racketeering enterprise charged in the indictment is the Sonoma County Charter of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. We will address the Sonoma Country Charter of the Hells Angels as HASC. So, HASC is a violent motorcycle club with members operating in Sonoma County. It has been in existence since the 1970s. The evidence at trial showed that the enterprise was engaged in murder, assault, robbery, extortion, witness intimidation, drug trafficking, weapons possession, and fraud, among other things. HSC members display patches, or tags, such as the filthy few, that advertise to the world that the particular member has engaged in violence on behalf of the organization. Not only does having the reputation of being skilled at fighting and inflicting violence lead to respect within the organization and fear among the public, it also enhances a member's position because other members will be less likely to challenge that member. Among the Hells Angels charters, HASC enjoyed close relationships with the Fresno and Salem Hells Angels. Members of HASC and members of these charters, including Brian Went, President of Fresno, and Christopher Ranieri, President of Salem, enjoyed close personal relationships. These bonds were demonstrated, among other ways, through expressions of support and admiration, through frequent visits, through celebration of anniversaries of Hells Angels membership, and through exchange of patches distinct to particular charters, such as the Young Guns tag from HASC and the Soldier tag from Rainieri and Salem. HASC styles itself as a democracy, under the principle of one man slash one vote, but it has a defined leadership structure, with officers such as President, Vice President, Sergeant at Arms, Secretary, and Treasurer. The President has influence over the enterprise, in organizing events, in setting the direction of the Charter, in addressing potential threats from rivals, etc. Further, some members had outsized influence, such as Raymond Folks. Folks took the President role from Russell Ott in the early 2000s, and although he had to surrender the title to Jonathan Nelson, because of several periods of incarceration, Folks still has significant influence because he is a nationally prominent Hells Angel. Folks is famous within the Enterprise because he sparked a riot between Hells Angels and the rival outlaw motorcycle gang the Mongols in Laughlin, Nevada in April 2002. That incident left one Mongol and two Hells Angels dead and over a dozen victims injured. Folks also had influence within HASC because he was an adept fighter. Disputes within HASC and among Hells Angels generally are frequently resolved through one-on-one -on -one fights between members. Because Folks was capable of punishing those who fought him, he came to have greater influence because other members were more reluctant to challenge him. The possibility of violence against rival outlaw motorcycle gangs was ever present to HASC. The most prominent rivals were the Mongols and the Vagos. HASC members were aware of the history of violence between themselves and these outlaw motorcycle gangs. The 2002 riot at Laughlin, although somewhat historical at the time of the events of this case, still had an impact on HASC, both in terms of folks' reputation among Hells Angels and in the knowledge that Mongols were significant rivals. Let's talk a little bit about the River Run Riot. From April 25th through April 28th, 2002, the 20th annual Laughlin River Run was held in Laughlin, Nevada. More than 60,000 people attended the event, including members of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club and the Mongols. There are a few different motives that have been discussed as being the cause of the River Run Riot event. For one, a stand at the rally were selling Hells Angels supporter gear and were hassled by members of the Mongols MC. A second possible motive was that hours before the riot took place, Hells Angels MC member, Christian Tate, was killed while riding home to San Diego, California. His body was found by California Highway Patrol with a bullet in the back and his driver's license sitting on the seat of his Harley Davidson motorcycle. The murder is still unsolved. On April 26, the second day of the river run, several minor arguments and assaults occurred between members of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club and Mongols. Before daybreak the following day, at 2.16 a.m., approximately 35 Hells Angels members left the Flamingo Hotel, a hotel traditionally used by the Hells Angels during the Laughlin River Run, and headed to the Harris Casino, the Mongols Hotel during the Laughlin River Run. They were carrying guns, knives, hammers and wrenches in their hands or under their clothing. When the Hells Angels arrived in the bar area, they were approached by about 40 Mongols members. 
Due to the Harrah's Casino having a significant number of security cameras, most of the events were captured on camera and later used in the charging and prosecution of those who were involved. There was some talking between the groups, with a Mongo asking the Hells Angels who was in charge of their group, to which a Hells Angels member replies and then shortly after some shouting begins. This is when Raymond Folks is said to have popped everything off, delivering a running fly kick on a member of the Mongols. A mass brawl breaks out on the Harrah's Casino gaming floor. Other Hells Angels members and associates then assaulted Mongols with dangerous weapons, including firearms, knives, hammers, and wrenches. Then, the guns go off. It was believed that the first shot may have been fired by a member of the Mongols, followed by a shot from a member of the police department who was responding to the incident. Other people have claimed that it was an undercover police officer who fired the first shot. Three were killed. Two were Hells Angels MC members and one was a Mongols MC member. Dozens were injured, including 16 being taken to the emergency department. Over 50 knives and multiple guns are taken into evidence by police. A lot of guys were arrested and sentenced to prison time, including folks who did a little over a year. That's a Little River Run history though. We are not going to detail all of the history of violence between the Hells Angels and the Mongols until a future video. Anyway, it is said that HASC used violence and the threat of violence to control other motorcycle clubs within HASC territory. If an organization wanted to present itself as a motorcycle club with the MC patch, and wanted to signal a particular territory, they had to ask permission of HASC to do so. If HASC granted this permission, the club was expected to pay taxes or dues for the right to display these patches, and they were expected to attend HASC events, which cost money, and to support the enterprise in other ways. One such club was the Ghost Warriors, a club founded by HASC member, Herb Cody. Ghost Warriors directly supported HASC, working for HASC in its events, providing security at the HASC clubhouse during HASC internal meetings, and paying regular dues to HASC. HASC was able to dictate the conduct of Ghost Warriors members, including making decisions on who they could associate with and expelling members. On one occasion, the Ghost Warriors fell behind in their dues payments. When HASC discovered this, they summoned the Ghost Warriors to the HASC clubhouse and administered a beating to all the members. HASC used violence to punish those whom it believed showed disrespect, including members of the public. The president of HASC, John Nelson, participated in such acts. One example happened in 2008. Nelson made headlines for knocking a man unconscious at McNear's in Petaluma, for accidentally bumping into him as he and the president of the San Francisco chapter were leaving. Nelson petitioned to wear his vest in court, and was not allowed. Nelson and San Francisco chapter president, Mark Guardado, were co-defendants and the case was ongoing. Not too long after this, Guardado was shot to death and his bike was stolen. That's a different story though. Another example of the Hells Angels iron fist was the June 2016 assault of someone we will call Victim 7. This resulted from two issues. The first arose from Victim 7's sponsorship of an HASC event. Victim 7 later agreed to sponsor a Ghost Warriors event as well, which angered HASC. More importantly, however, Victim 7 had gotten to know HASC member, Jeremy Greer. During their relationship, Greer made increasing demands of Victim 7, such as demanding the use of his vehicles. Victim 7 complained about Greer to a Ghost Warrior, who then reported this perceived disrespect to HASC. HASC members summoned Victim 7 to the HASC clubhouse. When he arrived, HASC members began beating him, breaking his wrist, among other injuries. Nelson also took a baseball bat and struck him in the head. The attack on someone we will call Victim 8 was remarkably similar. Victim 8 was a member of the Ghost Warriors, and he was a longtime friend of an employee of HASC member Russell Lyles' screen printing business. In January 2017, Lyles' relationship with that employee soured, and Lyles directed Victim 8 to have no contact with the former employee. Victim 8 ignored this directive, and in late July 2017, Victim 8 was arrested with this person during a residential burglary. After his arrest, Victim 8 reported the fact that he disobeyed Lyles' order to Lyles. Victim 8 was summoned to the HASC clubhouse to address this issue. After he arrived, Nelson and Lyles attacked him. During this assault, Nelson took a hammer and struck Victim 8 in the head, using the claw end of the hammer. While Victim 8 was being beaten, the other ghost warriors were summoned to the HASC clubhouse. Nelson ordered that Victim 8 be expelled from the ghost warriors, and Victim 8, injured and bloodied, was walked outside in full view of his former club members. Let's talk about the murder of Joel Silva, and the events that transpired after which landed these guys in prison. 
After Joel Silva disappeared, HASC members and associates were directed not to discuss Silva. Members and associates knew that Silva had been creating problems for HASC with his drug use, erratic behavior, attacks on non-Hells Angels guests at the clubhouse, and bullying. However, because he was big and skilled at fighting, he was a difficult person to challenge and correct. Eventually, Silva began questioning Nelson's leadership and creating problems with other charters. This came to a head during the June 2014 Laconia Motorcycle Week in Laconia, New Hampshire. In Laconia, Silva binged drugs and was up for days. He created problems for many of the Hells Angels he was with, including president of the Fresno Charter, Brian Went, and other members from Fresno. The tipping point of the trip came when Silva publicly announced that he was going to kill a Boston-slash-Salem Hells Angel named Sweeney, who was close to Boston-slash-Salem president, Christopher Rainieri. This directly violated the Hells Angel rule that one Hells Angel could not kill another Hells Angel. With that offense, Rainieri and Went decided that Silva had to be killed. Went and the Fresno Hells Angels returned to California, and soon after they arrived, they met with Nelson to address the issue. Nelson agreed that Silva needed to be dealt with. Because he was so outspoken and had so many non-Hells Angels connections in Sonoma County, it would be a problem for Silva to simply be expelled. It was better if he just disappeared, and Nelson agreed that this should happen. When Silva returned from Laconia, he realized that he was in trouble with the Hells Angels, and he was on edge. Silva expressed to several people, including his family, that he was in some kind of trouble with HASC and that he did not know how it was going to work out. He suggested that it was possible that he could disappear, and that if he did, HASC would claim he was on the run. He told people not to believe this story. To address Silva's unease, the plan was for Russell Ott to take Silva to Fresno, because Silva trusted Ott. Silva was told that he would travel to Fresno to address his problems with Brian Went. The two would likely fight, and afterward, the issue would be resolved. Ott was a long-tenured, respected member. He and Silva lived right near each other, and Ott was close with him and his family. On July 14, 2014, the day before Silva went missing, Went returned to California that evening. Also on July 14, Ott and Silva were in regular contact through text, and Ott and Nelson shared calls. In addition, Fresno member Merle Hefferman began calling a person at a crematorium in Fresno. Throughout the morning of July 15, 2014, Went, Nelson, and Rainieri exchanged a number of text messages and phone calls. Went also was calling and texting Hefferman and another Fresno member, Robbie Huff. Meanwhile, Silva was communicating with both Ott and Nelson, and Nelson was in touch with Ott. At around 11.30 a.m., Silva and Went talked on the phone, and shortly after that, Silva and Ott began heading to Fresno. Went and Rainieri then continued calling each other, and Went, Huff, and Hefferman were in contact as well. Shortly after 4 p.m., Silva and Ott arrived in the Fresno area. They traveled to the Fresno clubhouse, and there, Silva made his last call, at 4.36 p.m., to Brian Went. Silva later met with Went inside the clubhouse. Went told Silva that he had some marijuana for Silva to sell, and that it was underneath the stage. When Silva went over to the stage to examine it and bent down, Went shot him in the back of the head. He later bragged about how he had done this. The next morning, Hefferman called a worker at a local crematory. Hefferman had been attempting to make inroads at this facility and the funeral home with which it was associated, befriending the staff and asking for the keys to the crematory. He had not yet been successful, but on the morning of July 16, 2014, he called the worker and threatened him indicating that he was going to use the facility no matter what. That morning, the worker began the process of incinerating the first body of the day. He left the facility to get a drink at a nearby convenience store, and when he returned, he saw two young men in a hatchback car pulled up to the doors of the crematory. When he confronted them, one of the men lifted up his shirt to display a firearm in his waistband. The worker then backed off. This person was later identified as Gerald Williams, Hefferman's stepson. After five to ten minutes, the men drove off. The worker then went to the incinerator, and he saw that there was a second body inside. It was already on fire, so he could not remove it, so he increased the time for the oven. When the process was over, he carefully separated the ashes from the two bodies to preserve their dignity and process the two sets of remains. He held on to the ashes from the second body for a time, and then spread them in a nearby cemetery, which is the process for individuals who have no one to claim them. Later that day, Hefferman called the worker and threatened him again, 
to ensure that he not report what happened to law enforcement. After this, a brutal beating would take place involving folks. But before this, we have to talk a little bit about him in general. For sure he has a rep, and we spoke briefly about that earlier. But he has also made the headlines for a couple of events, one which is related to his actions charged in the indictment. For one, he had a pending drug case for meth in 2006. He also had a brush with death in 2008, when he had asked a non-member for a ride home in his truck from San Francisco, chapter president Mark Guardado's funeral, and the two were shot at in a drive-by. Folks was driving, and the passenger, 25-year-old William McLean, also his brother-in-law, died. His killer, a known gang member, received 21 years after being arrested with his juvenile girlfriend. It was said that a burrito was thrown at the killer's car before the murder took place. In 2011, Folks was indicted for his participation in a multi-million dollar mortgage scheme and was sentenced to six years. As a part of the scheme, he committed bank fraud and laundered the money to establish an indoor marijuana growing operation. He served three years and was released on probation. While he was locked up, a Hells Angels member engaged in sexual relations with Folks then common law wife. This rule was not meant to be broken and Folks would deal with the situation when he was released from prison. Sure enough, in 2016, the man who slept with Folks' wife was subjected to an hours-long beating and expelled. During that beating, he was punched, kicked, hit with a whip, and hit with a baseball bat. His tattoos were forcibly covered over with a tattoo gun, and Folks took that gun and crudely etched a line across victim 5's forehead. Nelson also took a pistol and struck victim 5 in the face, fracturing his orbital bone and causing vision problems that persist. He was about to shoot the man dead, but the other stopped him from doing so. The repeated blows to the man's midsection significantly worsened an abdominal hernia, and those injuries required significant surgeries to correct. During the beating, around 11 p.m., Folks allegedly called a woman and said that he needed to explain to her what was happening to her husband. The woman said she was concerned for her husband's safety so she drove to the club. Folks ordered her to get back into her car, and he got behind the wheel. Folks drove the woman to a secluded area off Bennett Valley Road and parked. There, he attacked the woman in a violent sexual assault and threatened to hurt her and her husband if she didn't comply. Folks then drove the woman back to the clubhouse and left her in her vehicle, investigators said. She reported the assault and due to Folks' criminal history, detectives enlisted the SWAT team and helicopter crew to look for Folks at his home on the 7500 block of Monet Place in Ronard Park about 6.30 p.m. He wasn't there. He would be arrested later and charged in this indictment. As we stated earlier, participators in the murder, along with folks were found guilty and are facing life in prison. This ends today's story. Please like, comment, subscribe, and let us know what you want to hear about next.